Hello, my dudes. So I saw this TikTok of Ashley Simpson performing in a Walmart to an audience of what looks like five kids. And I had to dive in. I needed to learn more about this. The pop star, Mall Tour. In case you have no idea what a Mall Tour is, basically it is a free public performance right in the middle of an indoor shopping mall. Imagine you're walking along, gonna get a pretzel, and you hear singing. Now, of course, busking is a thing, it's very common for people to sing in public places to try to get attention, tips, or gain an audience. Cue that meme of Halsey singing in a mall. Or the classic Walmart yodeling kid. Now, as fascinating as those instances are, that is not what this video is about. We are talking about your record label sending you to at least a handful of malls across the US. We're talking Cincinnati, Ohio. We're talking Paramus, New Jersey. You are gonna meet those teens and tweens where they are, or at least where they were until the death of malls. I wanted to cover this topic because one, I love discourse about the role of shopping malls in society. And two, I love the wonderful nostalgia of 90s and early 2000s pop stars. Consider this format a kind of Wikipedia surfing. This is what it's like in my brain because I am addicted to Googling everything. Once something crosses my mind, I have to spend the next few hours hopping from tab to tab, memorizing random facts as if they're gonna pop up on this week's trivia. It's a blessing and a curse. And if you saw my last video, which was all about my neurotic self-conscious video making process, I'm trying to shake that off a little bit. So if you're wondering right now, what is the point of this video to Tiffany. The point is, I had an interest. I wanted to Google. That's it. Thank you. Enjoy. And also cheers to me for trying to avoid copyright strikes all over this video. Before we continue, this portion of today's video is sponsored by Peach and Lily. Peach and Lily offers Korean beauty and skincare products. I was really excited to try these. Their products are vegan, cruelty-free, fragrance-free. For context, I have sensitive skin, some occasional breakouts. Like today, I'm rocking some whiteheads. Love that. Anyway, I am not a 12-step skincare routine girly. If you are, they have plenty of products, everything you could want or need. But personally, I prefer for my routine to be pretty quick and simple. So here are the products I'd like to share with you. First up, their Ginger Melt Oil Cleanser. This is great at melting away makeup and SPF, anything oil-based. It works great for me. There's no greasiness or residue left over. Second, I use their very popular Glass Skin Refining Serum. This helps to hydrate and firm skin, and it can also brighten dark spots. Always nice to help even out skin texture, any pigmentation issues. And lastly, the Matcha Pudding Antioxidant Cream. This is just such a great, lightweight, very soft moisturizer. Overall, by the end of this routine, my skin feels very light, clean, and hydrated. Dare I say, plump and fresh. Again, I am not a pro. I don't want an overly complicated, scary skincare routine. So I love that these products are very gentle, yet effective, and so easy to use. If you are looking to try out some new skincare or beauty products soon, I highly recommend Peach and Lily. You can use my link and promo code in the description. Okay, so let's dive in. We're going back to the 80s, baby. We have to start with the story of Tiffany, not me, this girly. Tiffany, just Tiffany, is often credited with popularizing the mall tour concept. I'm sure there were probably some other people who maybe had performed in a mall at one point or another, but her tour really brought the concept to the mainstream. So this is a mini version of her life story. Tiffany Renee Darwish, born October 2nd, 1971, a fellow Libra. From an early age, she loved to sing, loved to perform. By the time she was in Nine, Tiffany was earning money as a professional singer. When she was 14 in 1985, she made it to second place on the talent show Star Search. Soon after, she signed a management deal with George Tobin and got an MCA record deal. Her debut album, Tiffany was released in 1987, but her first single didn't really land. Everyone was like, hmm, what do we do with this teenage singer? She's not gonna fit in at the clubs. Tobin thought of an idea. Let's send her to the mall. 
Tiffany will be singing to pre-recorded music tracks to promote a new album and generate a following. Her manager is betting that this marketing spin will be a hit. Brad Schmidt said, We wanted to take her where her peer group hangs out all summer long. America's playgrounds, the malls. So for a little tangent, why the mall? In the US and many other places, indoor shopping malls have been dying for a while now. But for many decades, malls were the place to hang out, especially for young people. Go we're at the mall! Oh my god, I love the mall. There was mall culture. Teenagers were called mall rats for just hanging around the mall at all times. It was the default place to meet up with friends, window shop, try on clothes, even if you weren't spending money, eat at the food court, chill by the fountain, people watch. Maybe your mall had an arcade, a bowling alley, or a movie theater. But it wasn't just for young people. Indoor malls are great for all ages. And they're especially useful during extreme weather. You can still get your steps in just strolling around the perfectly temperature-controlled mall. Malls have functioned as a third place, especially for those living in the suburbs. A third Third place is basically a community hub. It's not home, it's not work, it's the third place. It's somewhere to hang out in public, to chill, to socialize. So these could be malls, libraries, coffee shops, etc. And of course, much can be said about malls being a consumerist hellscape of capitalism, a car-centric mess with an endless expanse of parking lots, and those critiques are extremely valid. But in researching this video, I have felt a lot of nostalgia for mall culture. Even though I personally spent my teenage years at our outdoor local town center, the mall still felt special and exciting to me throughout my childhood. And it was a major part of the media I consumed, especially about what it means to be a teenager. Going to the mall with a couple dollars in your pocket, the freedom to meet up with your girlies and watch your crush from afar. Anyway, I'm trying to stop myself from writing an entire dissertation on malls because I don't want this video to go completely off the rails. So let's get back to it. And thus, Tiffany's iconic mall tour was born. It has an incredible name, by the way. The Beautiful You, Celebrating the Good Life, Shopping Mall Tour 87. So at this point, she is 15 years old. She performs three 20 minute sets at each stop. Unsurprisingly, at the start of the tour, she's kind of flopping. She's just a random girl singing in the middle of the mall. Tiffany said at the first few stops, she would only have a handful of people come by to listen. From one weekend to the other, you never knew what to expect because um, one weekend you'd be in a mall and you'd sit up for the entire weekend and throughout the weekend, maybe you'd only gather 10 people. 10? And you still went on? <laughs> still Did went on. Did you have on. a band? During the tour, though, her next song begins to get popular. Her second single is I Think We're Alone Now. It's a cover of the 1967 song originally by Tommy James and the Shindells. I think we're alone now. I just realized I don't think I've ever watched the entire music video. I like, obviously, that they include real footage from the mall tour. That's cute. That's lovely. But the rest of it, there's like six different concepts. I think we're alone now. I think we're alone now. I think we're alone now. Look at all these cool video effects. They just said, let's just put a little bit of everything in this. Let's get a couple background dancers for a scene. By November of that year, it becomes a hit. It's number one, baby. So by the end of the mall tour, her shows were attracting swarms of fans. So what are the other benefits of marketing in a mall? What is the mall tour promotional strategy? Is this actually a good business move? Sheridan noted, the mall wasn't just a marketplace for consumers, but also a marketplace for producers. Where else could you find a highly concentrated area of diverse demographics to test out your latest marketing campaign? With these mall tours, the corporate sponsors get some attention. The mall enjoys more shoppers. For kids and parents, it's just pretty convenient to combine a shopping trip with a free concert. Plus, product demonstrations have existed for a long time in malls. Here's a little fashion show. Here's a cooking showcase. And you can purchase any of these lovely items right here in the mall. So in this instance, the pop star is also a product. There they are, demonstrating themselves as a commodity. You can go to the record store and buy their album. Check out those stores so you can buy a similar outfit and look like them. According to the record labels who used this strategy, they called it a very symbiotic relationship between the artists and the mall and the management. So why did Tiffany and this song work? 
I do think the mall tour itself is just kind of a gimmick. It's an interesting strategy, and there was a fair bit of news coverage about it, which helped to promote Tiffany, but I don't think it was just the mall tour that, like, caused this flame to spark. I think Tiffany was just in the right place at the right time when young audiences were looking for someone closer to their age to look up to. Today, obviously, seeing a solo teenage artist have a number one song or a number one album is pretty common. But from what I've seen back in the late 80s, this concept was pretty new. The whole teen pop star really took off during the 90s and early 2000s. What Tobin and Schmidt understood, and nobody else in the record business seemed to realize, is that millions of young and preteen girls who stock the nation's shopping malls had no role model younger than Madonna, who at the time was 29. The number one says, Tiffany herself was part of a whole new wave of bubblegum pop kids who were aggressively marketed to America's teenage and preteen kids, their own generational cohort. So at the same time, there was another teen star on the rise, Debbie Gibson. So of course, the media created this fake rivalry between them. Do you hate that other girl who's like totally your competition? And both girls were like, no. Spoiler, they've been friends for decades now. Anyway, aside from just being a teenager, what was Tiffany's appeal? A commenter on one of these articles said, she was the girl next door, non-threatening, glamour-free, and relatable. She hung out in shopping malls. Again, I know a relatable teen being popular sounds like the most obvious thing ever, but apparently it was a big deal. Tiffany thought her image was pretty laid back. She described herself as real casual. My image is jeans, an oversized sweatshirt, t-shirt, a pair of boots or sneakers. Very simple. And that's what I feel comfortable in. Even Tiffany was well aware at the time that having a down-to-earth, relatable image was very important to her branding. She knew that her fans could dress like her. Her style was affordable and accessible, unlike the more glam or luxurious celebrities. Oh, she's just in. She's in. She's today. I think she's a very talented singer. I think she sounds like a young Stevie Nicks. I love that type of sound. I don't know. I just think she's good. Tiffany was setting records. Records. According to Billboard magazine, Tiffany was the youngest female artist to earn a number one album and also the youngest to have two back-to-back -back number one singles. Let's talk about the manufactured teen pop star because I think Tiffany is an early example of this. In recent years, Tiffany has said she doesn't like being called manufactured. She doesn't agree with that label. And I get it because she's definitely not like an industry plant. She isn't a Nepo baby. So I don't think people mean it in that way. She was a teenager who could sing. So she was talented, but the manufactured side is, I guess, in the way that her manager, George Tobin, molded her and, you know, he handled all the music, all the marketing, all the PR moves. She even said it herself. She said, Tiffany is the voice. The songs are George Tobin and the arrangements are George Tobin. All the production values are George Tobin. But overall, in reading lots of articles about her and watching a lot of interviews, I'm just reminded of the tragedies of child fame. Even as a younger kid, Tiffany loved to sing, loved to perform, but in order to be marketed to audiences, you have to have branding. You have to be a product. When she was young, oh, should she be a little country star? Mm, that didn't really work. At 13, they tried to turn her into a little rocker. That wasn't a great fit either. In this era, when she blew up, she seemed to genuinely get to dress in the ways that she wanted, and that's great, but you cannot be an autonomous artist as a 15 year old and a 15 year old with a number one album. When you are a money making machine, a lot of people and businesses are invested in your success. They want you to continue to make more money so that they can take some of it. And therefore they're going to control what you do. One of the darkest parts of child stardom is the fact that so many people are making bank off a child. A child's work, a child's talent. Parents, managers, agents, executives. Even early on, Tiffany's parents, especially her stepfather, had a vested interest in her income. Uh, mainly the situation was I had a stepfather who uh, kind of looked at my career as a vacation. And he, he went wherever the gigs were? Well, no, he kind of thought, this will support me for the rest of my life. Why should I work? And I think reality is you never know how long you're going to be in this business. Mm. And you might need to reinvest in your career. So it's important to save your money. And that's really what I wanted to do. And I was striving for a trust fund. Mm. And I had been singing from the time when I was nine. And I didn't know at the time that I had no bank account. 
until I was about 14 and my mother and my stepfather were divorced. And I found out a lot of things that I hadn't, I never knew. From the Tiffany Wikipedia, in 1988, at the peak of her popularity, Tiffany was embroiled in a conflict in which Tobin fought her mother and stepfather over control of her career and earnings. This led to a court fight in which Tiffany tried to have herself declared an emancipated minor. In an interview, Tiffany said, Really what I was striving for was a blocked account. That I couldn't touch my money, no one could touch my money, and I could be assured that it would be there later on in the future for me. She said she didn't even necessarily want to be emancipated from her mother, but she wanted to guarantee herself more control over her money and her future. Quote, I had to go to that extreme to have any say. But it wasn't just her parents. During the emancipation trial, Tiffany's mother's contention was that Tobin had too much control of Tiffany's career and earnings. That contract called for Tobin to get 50% of Tiffany's royalties and a 20% cut for his management duties, numbers that are high by industry standards. Tiffany had a number one album, two number one hit songs, her music had generated over $5 million in revenue. A huge chunk of that went straight to George Tobin. According to this article, she had a trust account that she couldn't touch until she turned 18. It had about half a million dollars in it. In the meantime, legal fees are mounting. Attorneys in this case estimate the legal bills had totaled more than $250,000. When the dust clears, both sides agree, Tiffany will probably have to pay for all of it. It is always tragic to see talented, successful kids get taken advantage of by everyone around them. Everyone that they should be able to trust to have their best interests at heart. So, Tiffany did not stay at the top of the charts for very long. She really had a year or two of her peak, and then her career kind of declined. She has been able to maintain a music career her entire life. She's released many albums. She's continued touring. She's done nostalgia tours with other 80s pop icons, plus some celebrity reality TV shows. She looks like she's been having a pretty fun time, and she's made the most of her hit songs and hit album. And occasionally, Tiffany will return to do a show at a mall for old time's sake. So, continuing on, the mall tour promotional strategy caught on and a lot of young performers did this circuit. Some were successful, they got lucky, and their music got popular, and others have faded back into obscurity. Initially, when I was researching, I just wanted to be able to share a lot of examples of different strategies, different mall tours. I found that some people or groups went on mall tours not to perform, but more so to do Q&As and sign autographs. There were many honorable mentions some featured here in pictures. And also, honestly, it was kind of hard to research this because a lot of these mall tours were very small and relatively insignificant. There wasn't a lot of media coverage. And if there wasn't any footage re-uploaded anywhere, it's hard for me to learn more about the essence of the mall tour. So with that, I just decided to highlight a handful of mall tours in this video. But if you remember any or know of any other good examples, let me know. So next we have the iconic Britney Spears and her L'Oreal Hair Zone Mall Tour 1998. So this is a decade after Tiffany's Mall Tour, and interestingly, I found a few parallels between both of their early careers. Britney also performed throughout her childhood, and she was also on Star Search. But honestly, who wasn't? Look at any star from the 90s, 2000s. Everyone was on Star Search. In Britney's early teen years, apparently three record labels rejected her, arguing audiences wanted pop bands such as the Backstreet Boys and the Spice Girls, and there wasn't going to be another Madonna, another Debbie Gibson, or another Tiffany. We'll see about that. So Britney's management had a similar promotion strategy. Let's do a mall tour to promote your upcoming debut album. At this point, Britney is 16 years old. She's on the mall tour from June to August 1998. Absolutely killing it, by the way. Classic Britney performances. Then she goes to open for NSYNC on tour. Her album gets released in January 1999. Um, Baby One More Time, ever heard of it? Then she has to go back to finish the mall tour with a number one song. She's going back to the mall. And I think that's the wildest part watching these videos. My first single and it's called Baby One More Time. Woo! <laughs> this next song I'm going to do is my first single. 
starting a dinky little mall tour as an unknown artist. And then a few months later, your mall shows are overwhelmed with fans. You're the top artist in the country. Amazing. It's so cool to watch these videos because you can see the differences in the crowds and the energy between the starting clip and the end of the tour. So yeah, I just found it a little interesting um, comparing their early careers. It's not super surprising because obviously teenage stars, pop stars tend to follow kind of similar paths. Obviously, Tiffany ended up having a different career trajectory and Britney became a literal icon. Unfortunately, like many child stars, Britney also famously struggled with family and management to control her income, career, and life overall. I found it kind of bittersweet to to watch these old clips when Britney was up and coming. On one hand, her dreams are about to come true and that's amazing, but also we know that she's gonna go through a lot of shit in the future. Did I get emotional watching all these old clips? Maybe. And for our last example, we jump ahead to 2004 and I'm not changing outfits again because this is already too much, but we have one of my faves, Miss Avril Lavigne. What's up, boys? So what do you guys want to do today? Dude, you want to crush them all? Nice. Okay. I was a huge Avril fan, especially in this era. The first song I ever performed on stage was Complicated at a YMCA concert. The talent show, calm yourself. I fully forgot an entire verse, but I loved it. And also, my first ever real concert was an Avril Lavigne show. So she's thoroughly embedded in my childhood brain. Anyway, the Live by Surprise Tour, AKA the Top Secret Mall Tour, was performed at malls in the US and Canada. Details of each location were not revealed until 48 hours before the event commenced. Ooh, feels like a fun little secret concert, like a little hole in the wall. Come right now, they're performing. Can you believe it? They're in a dive bar, except it's a um, mall for children. But basically, if you were signed up for her fan site, you would get an email with the details. You have 48 hours to prepare for the show of a lifetime, meaning call your friends and figure out whose mom can chaperone and carpool. At each stop, Avril performed acoustic renditions of six songs, some of her previous hits, and some new songs from her latest album, Under My Skin, Bangers. There is some very cute footage of all the excited fans. She's real, she writes her own lyrics, and I think she's really cool. I heard it on a radio station, and I was just like begging my mom to skip school to come. I think it's awesome because people that can't go see her in the concert just get to come here for free. Now I know. And ultimately, I agree. I think free performances are always nice, though every mall tour is obviously a marketing ploy. These kinds of appearances can still be very special and meaningful for local fans. Lastly, I want to end by quoting some of this article by Julianne Shepard, absolutely roasting our rock chick. Avril's not the first person to tour the mall. She joins a long and sugary procession of Tiffany's, Debbie Gibson's, InSync's, Britney's, and Mandy Moore's who've hawked their tunes in American shopping compounds. For candy pop stars, the mall tour is logical because you're dropping in straight on your fans, teens and tweens, aka Americans with buying power. But the second you play a gig in a mall, all pretense that your music was more than a cog in the perpetual machinations of capitalism are ground up in the garbage disposal. This is a problem in particular for the, quote, punk rocker rebel image of Avril. When does one realize their art is merely a product? When their acoustic version of Skater Boy gets drowned out by the sound of Jamba Juice blenders? That roast. I mean, again, I'm an Avril fan, but I loved it. We do not need to get into the is she punk or not discourse, but I did like this short piece, and I honestly feel like Avril would have agreed. She didn't really look like she was enjoying the mall tour very much, and that also speaks to kind of the intensity of touring. I watched interviews of hers where she said, of course, she loves to perform her songs, but she didn't love the travel. She didn't like, you know, jet setting all over the place and showing up exhausted and running in to perform a few songs and then running away. I get that. That's pretty hectic, but it, it's kind of like part of the requirements of being a touring hit pop star. Anyway, I think all of us feel conflicted when we have to do the capitalist things, the parts of our jobs that maybe don't fully align with our values. Existential crisis. Anyway, mostly I laughed because the mall tour is always a bit clunky. That's a shared theme throughout all of these videos and everything that I watched is like, some of the footage can look super sick and then some of it just looks so dorky because it represents like this random stage in the middle of the mall, some kids, some parents, they don't know who this is. What's going on? But like, imagine. 
Okay, please have your attention. The store will be closing in five minutes. Mall tours are weird. They were always weird. Um, and I I love them for that. So there we go. I hope you all enjoyed this weird little mini reflection on mall tours. It's funny because I'm like, oh, like the kids these days are missing out on mall tours. I never went to a mall tour performance, at least not that I recall. So it's kind of fascinating in itself that I've become so interested in this thing, this cultural relic that, again, I was never even a part of. It was just like, vaguely around, but I'm glad that we did this. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I do have more random fun facts that I had to cut from the script, so I'm probably gonna turn that into this month's bonus video on Patreon. With that, thank you to my patrons. I have a Patreon where I do a monthly bonus video, keep you guys updated on what I'm working on. Extra thank yous to my executive producer tier. We have Uwu Face, Eric Danielson, Freshly Laundered, Jackie King, Jill Hoffman, Julie Leva, Kristen Holloman, Matthew Gray, Meg Megan Collins, Megcat33, Nicole Louise, Online DBT Skills, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, Tom Walker, Treffa, and VivianOladun.com. Thank you for being patrons. And thank you again to Peach and Lily for sponsoring this video. Check out the link and promo code in the description. That is all for today. Stay tuned for future internet analysis videos. If you didn't see my last video, it's a doozy. <laughs> if you want to see more of what goes on in this brain of mine, watch this video about how video essays have kind of melted my brain. Okay, thanks. Bye.